awesome. Uh, if this is your first time ever at 242, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, let me just start off by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Brad. I'm the teaching pastor here. And uh, we're doing this series called Stick Together. And what we've been talking about is relationships of all kinds. Because I realize, you know, in this room, we have so many different people. We have people who are single and looking. There's people who are single and happily single. We have married people, young married people, newly married people. Uh, we have people, you know, who have children and don't have children. But what we all want is healthy relationships. Healthy relationships with our family, healthy relationships with the people around us. And so that really that's what this series is all about. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about this topic of parenting. Now, here's the deal. <laughs> What they tell you, you know, in Bible college is, is there's two things that you just, you shouldn't talk about. There's two things that people don't want to hear about. There's two things that people don't want to be told what to do. They don't want to be told what to do with their money, and they don't want to be told what to do with their kids. So now that we've finished our generosity moment, uh, I'm excited <laughs> to be here to talk about parenting with you. Um, but I think this is important. And this is important whether you have children or you don't have children. I'm going to be speaking a lot to parents today. But, but even if you don't have children, this is important because we have a generation coming up that matters to God. And we have a generation coming up that many of you adults in this room, you have an impact on. Even if they're not your children, the, the, the children in your neighborhood, the children in your family, your nieces, your nephews, the children of your friends, the way that you can encourage your friends as they are parenting, we are in this together. And, and, and it's important that we really speak into this generation because it's interesting to see what's happening. In 2012, the June issue of The New Yorker, there was a quote that said, with the exception of the imperial children of the Ming dynasty, the American children of this generation are the most indulgent children to ever walk this earth. That stings. That stings. I mean, they're basically highlighting that, you know, our kids have this, this idea of, of, of entitlement just from, just from being, just from existing. And then maybe that's not the most healthy way to live. In fact, I mean, even if you don't agree with that sentiment or you don't agree with that statement, it's undeniable that when you look at French culture and Peruvian culture specifically, the average French uh, six-year-old can do more household chores consistently than the average American 25-year-old. That's, I mean, that's fact, laundry, cleaning up, dishes, food. We're missing the boat on something. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about this day is this idea of parenting, because I get it, I get it. Your kids are cute, right? They're all cute and they're special. Your child's special, not theirs, yours. You know, like, you know, and they're cute and they're special and we want to equip them. But here's the deal. At some point, we have to allow our kids to grow. We have to set up our children for success. We have to let them grow. And that's what we're talking about today. And really, my first question to you is just this. Where do you go for that knowledge? I mean, where do we go? Where do we encourage people to go to learn about this thing called parenting? Because it's interesting, there's, there's no set place you have to go, right? I mean, I just think about like my life, like when I wanted to operate a machine, when I wanted to, to learn how to drive, I had to do 30 hours of in-course work. I had to do 50 hours of apprenticing and driving in a road with another adult in the car that had a brake pedal on their side, right? Kids today, they have to drive, even when they get their license, they have to go for months where they can only ride with their parents. They can't have like other kids in the cars with them. And that's just to drive a car, you know? Or if, you know, even if you want to be a doctor, right? If I want to manipulate like a human body, I have to go through years of undergrad school, years of grad school, years of medical residency, all in a highly competitive environment, weeding out the people who can't handle the pressure, the people who can't get the job done. So only the people who are equipped to do the task get through. But if you want to change a life, if you want to be in charge of a soul, like a living being, all you have to do is make a baby. And let's be honest, that process is not too hard, all right? I mean, you, you just, you make a child and you're a parent. You don't have to go through any coursework, you don't have to, nothing is required of you. In fact, I really believe I filled out more paperwork for my iPhone uh, than I did for my child, right? I don't know about you, but I just remember leaving the hospital and, and they're like, here's your baby. And I'm just like, what am I going to do with this? 
Like I literally just impulse bought a Hot Pocket. I don't think I make good enough decisions <laughs> to be in charge of this life. And, I, and that's how so many families start off and so many parents start off. And that's why we need places to, to go and truth. Because here's the thing. Go to your local bookstore. Look in the parenting section. Look at all the books that are there. Which one's right? Discipline your child. Dare to discipline. Be firm. Be, be direct. Da, da, da. Cuddle your child. Love your child. It's a child sense of life. Like, what's true? Where do we go? And so for my, my time today, and what I just want to highlight is, is what if the best way to raise our children it was already written out for us? What if the best way to speak into the lives of this next generation was already modeled for us? What if we could go to the word of God and apply it and see our children's lives changed? Because here's the thing, it takes that kind of intentional focus, it takes that kind of intentional effort, I think, to do this. One of my favorite verses about children, and it's not on the screen, I just wanna read it to you. If you're taking notes, you can write it down. It's Psalm 127. This is one of my favorite verses when it comes to children. Psalm 127, verse four, it says, like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are children born in one's youth. And I love that because if you're a hunter, if you're a hunter in this room, you know like with, like with an arrow, there is intentionality with an arrow. Like bow season is coming up. You don't just like walk into the woods and just like start firing off arrows, you know, like hope I hit a deer. Like <laughs> with the arrows, there are intentionality. You, you put it in, you draw it back. You're like, no, 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 not ready yet. It's no, no, not ready yet. And when you let it loose, you know that it's the right moment and that that arrow was ready to do what it's designed to do. And think, I mean, even if you're a hunter, think about just the times that you were like reluctant to shoot an arrow just because of the cost of it. You're like, this is so much money, I'm gonna let go of it. You know, like, what if I don't get it back? How much more valuable are our kids? And too many times, we send our kids off without intentionality. We just send our kids off into this world without focus. And so, what I want to do today is I just want to highlight just two things. And, and I and get it, parenting is way more difficult than just these two things. But, I, I, but for the time I have, I just want to just maybe just get us on the first step down the road of this and highlight two things. And for me, when I think about this, I think about tomatoes. Stick with me. This is how my mind works. Um, I don't know if we have anybody in the room with green thumbs. Um, I do not have green thumbs, okay? I had a chia herb garden that got weeds in it. I don't even know how that's possible, okay? Um, but I remember when I was growing up, and long story short, my parents, like, I guess they watched like one too many episodes of Green Acres and they're like, we're moving in the country, you know? Like, and we moved like 55 acres of land. We bought a horse that nobody rode. It was just like a giant dog. And like, it was just, they went off the deep end with that, but anyway. <laughs> But I remember we get this land and we're going to be farmers now. I got overalls and, um, and we went to like the, the store because we were going to buy plants and, and, and seeds and we're going to you know, grow farm. And so we went to go get tomatoes in particular because this, it tripped me out. I don't, have you ever bought like tomatoes, grown tomatoes from seeds or did you try? I didn't even know there was, so we went to buy the seeds and this is what the clerk, you know, the clerk says, here's your seeds, got your seeds, I'm ready to grow a tomato. This is how my mind works. I'm ready to grow a tomato. And he's like, do you have soil? I'm like, yeah, I got 55 acres of dirt. It's everywhere. I will throw the seed down in the dirt. I'm good to go. And he's like, no, my child. You need soil, which apparently is just a word for really expensive dirt, you know? And like, but soil, right, it's, it's different than dirt. It's rich in nutrients. It has everything that that plant needs. And it's really the foundation for that plant. The, 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 the quality of the soil will dictate the health of the plant. And so he tells me the importance of this, and so I buy him buying bags of soil, even though I own all this dirt. And, and, and then we, you know, I'm going to check out, and he's like, do you have cages? I'm like, are these tomatoes going to attack my neighbor? Like, do I need to, like, is this like, I mean, are these killer tomatoes? Did I grab the wrong ones? Like, why do I need a cage? And he's like, well, here's what's going to happen. If you have good soil, 
your plant's going to grow. And as it's grow, it's going to start to have these tomatoes. And as the tomatoes grow, they're going to weigh the plant back down to the ground. And the tomatoes are going to rest on the ground, and they're going to rot. So you have to have a cage. You have to have a framework. So as the tomatoes grow, it's supported. And then if you do that, then the fruit will come. And tomatoes are technically fruits. And so I thought, that's awesome. And I think that is exactly what our children need. I mean, just as I look through Scripture, I think that's a perfect illustration for what God is calling us to do. Soil framework. Soil framework. And I see those two things in Jesus. I mean, if, if, I'm, if I'm opening the Bible and I'm like, God, how do I be a parent? I mean, maybe the first question I'm going to ask is, God, what did you highlight as a parent? What did you want to instill? I mean, if, if Jesus is the son of God, right, and he, he came to this, what did you instill in your son before you loosed him on this world? Book of John, chapter 1, talking about Jesus, said, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. And look what he's full of, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Before God let his Son come into this world to take on the mission that God had for him to do, he made sure he was full of grace and truth, the soil and the framework. And I believe it. I, I, I think grace and truth are the two wings of the bird that we need to put this generation on the back of to soar. And so what does it look like to raise up our children in grace? What does that look like? To, to, have, to, to plant them in the soil of grace. The, you know, Psalms talks about this. It talks about the importance of, you know, being close to God. Um, Psalm, uh, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 3. It says this, and I love this verse. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you will be rooted and established in love, and you may have power together with the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. Like, like God saying, like, as our earthly father, like, what he wants is to you to know that you're rooted in his love, that you matter to him. And really, I think those two words sum up what it is to be in grace, to know that you matter. I think about my children. My children are, you know, three and five, and I talked about this before. And, and what's interesting is, is psychologically, children between the ages of zero and 10, this is like prime years to talk about grace. This is prime years to talk about this because between the ages of zero and 10, uh, psychology will tell you that your children don't even realize that you as parents could be wrong. Right? Through zero, the age of zero to ten, they trust you. The age of zero to ten, they believe you. Whatever you say, they're like, is that true? Okay, Michigan's the greatest football team ever? Okay, they are. One day they will learn. Anyway, um, it's a rough season, I'm telling you. But zero to ten, they, they, they believe you. In fact, I heard one, one guy said, you know, zero to ten is where parenting happens. Ten on is just counseling from that point, right? Like, it's just... But zero and ten, I cannot think of anything more important than our children to learn that you matter. You matter. You matter to me. You matter to God. You matter to this community. And whatever happens for the rest of your life, whatever decisions you make, whatever decisions are made upon you, whatever you uh, achieve or fail at, nothing changes the foundation, the grace, the soil that you matter. And how do you instill that into your child? How do we instill this into this generation? I think obviously we have to do that verbally. We verbally have to let them know you matter. For me, one thing I do is, you know, maybe like once a week or so, I'm putting my daughter to bed. You, know, you do the game. We've all done the game, right? How much does mommy and daddy love you? And she's like, this much? And I'm like, no, more. This much? 
And I'm like, no more. And she's like, around the house? And I'm like, more. And she's like, from here to the moon? I'm like, more. She's like, from here to Chuck E. Cheese? Right? It sounds like I'm going backwards, but to a five-year-old, Chuck E. Cheese is like the greatest thing in the world, right? And you play that game for a while, and, and, and maybe you've done that before, but, but I always ask this follow-up question, and maybe this is something you could do with your kids. I always say, and do you know why mommy and daddy love you? It's interesting to see where their mind goes. It's interesting to see what their answer is. Because my card stayed on green all day at school? No. Because... I was nice to my sister and I didn't bite anybody? No. <laughs> Whatever they say, it, it comes back to no. It's because you're mine. It's because you're my child. That's enough. That's all it needs to be. You matter to me. And I think when we, when we plant our youth, when we plant our children into this kind of soil and they grow up, they're going to grow up with a self-confidence that's not going to be so easily shaken by what the world throws at them. And they're going to grow up with the truth that, that, that their value does not come from anything they do, but it comes from who they are and whose they are, that they matter to their parents, that they matter to God. So we need to instill that verbally. I think we also need to instill that non-verbally. And, and, and here's what we need to realize as parents. By, uh, by all studies, your children learn more by what you do than by what you, stay, what you say. They, they, they know the truth more so by what you, your actions than, than your words. And, and so if we want to instill this idea that, that you live in grace and, and that you matter, then we, we have to not just say it, we have to live it out. And I think that comes with what we do with our time. Yeah, I know there's the whole debate, you know, quality time versus quantity time, and I think it's both. I think, I think you need to have both, but, but I think quantity time is so important, particularly ages zero to 10. Because what you do lets your child know what's important to you. What you do with your free time lets your child know what's important to you. So if you come home every day and you just jump on your computer and your child's like, can I have a piggyback ride? Let's play horses, let's do, and you're like, no then you're sending a message. If, if you just get caught up in housework all the time, sending a message, when you come home and you try to do some extra work all the time, they will learn that what you do is more valuable than spending time with them. And so we need to say it in quality time, but we also need to say it in quantity time. You know, and at 242, like understand, like that's our heart. Like at 242, like as a church, like that's, that's what we want to do for your children as best we can. You know, we, we have a whole children's ministry back there, you know, our kid community. And those of you with young children, you know the process. You know, you check them, you check them in, you put them in a classroom. But, but maybe you don't realize that, like, that's not just child care, right? Like, like, we love those children, every single one of them, except child 342. If that name comes up one more time, no, I don't. <laughs> I just made that number up. If you're like, what's my number? No, I'm like, I just made that up. Um, but we realize the importance of quantity time. So, so we want to instill into your children that we as a church, we love them and that they matter. And so that's why we, we encourage people, whenever you come to a service each week, try to come to the same hour because your classrooms are staffed by the same people each hour so that they can learn your child's name, that they can see your child's progression, that they can, they can know your child and they can instill into your child that, that they matter. And, and maybe you haven't met some of the people back there who, who work with your children. I just want to share a short video with you uh, of some of these people and why they love doing what they do. Uh, let's check this out. Being in Kitco has really helped me learn um, how to be a better person and be an example for kids and kind of has changed the way that I've thought of how I should live my life. It's softened my heart quite a bit and has just given me um, a bigger desire to serve. The kids there, they're just, they're, they come in, um, they're just full of energy, and they're just ready to learn. We've got first to fourth graders, and they're just at an age where um, they, they want to hear about Jesus, and they want to hear the stories, and they, they want to worship, and they, they love doing moves uh, in videos, and that's just, it's just really fun for me to be a part of that and to be able to serve God in that way and serve these kids. Truly, God was calling me to work with these young children, and it felt like it was the right thing to do, and I'm excited to come every single Sunday. 
I do feel it has brought me closer to God. Um, for instance, when we're praying with the children, it's really neat when you get them to hold their hands and close their eyes. And I, I really feel like I'm, you know, helping them make that connection. It's a very rewarding, enriching experience. The people, the volunteers that we have now are absolutely fantastic. Our leadership team is fantastic. Mr. Jordan, Mr. Eric, you, know, you just can't get any better than that. Um, give it a try. Um, see how you like it. I'm sure you will. Uh, no one, uh, no one ever looked at a kid dancing and singing and having fun and thought that wasn't someplace I want to be. You should definitely jump into it because it's a, a life-changing experience. It, it definitely changed my life and my family's life, and uh, I think it's. Uh, uh, very important part of this church. You're going to love it. It's a great group of people that you get to meet and you get to spend some time with. Um, it makes church so much more fun. You see friendly faces all over the place once you really start putting more time in. And it makes um, kind of a big church feel very small and very just homey, like a big group of friends. It's wonderful. Yeah, so if you go back there, even if you don't have kids, you just walk through the hallway, you see someone with the orange lanyards, give them a high five, you know, because they love your kids. But here's the deal. We always say at 242, like, like we, are, we are parenting alongside you. We, we want to help you parent. Because like, even if you came to church every single week, every single of all year long, the most that we have to impact your children is 52 hours a year. You spend that much time with your children in a couple days. And, and, so, and so we just want to equip you as parents to raise up your child in grace and truth and we have resources, we have like, uh, online resources with Right Now Media that's available to you if you are a member here at 242. We have parenting classes. We have, we, we have all this available because we just want to set you up for success. So we, the soil of grace. And then just real briefly, the framework of truth. Our gen next generation, these children, they need truth. They need to know that there's consequences. They need to know that their life matters. They need to know that, that there's a calling on their life. The kids that I see that lack truth, and you know who they are, because you see them every year for like the first four weeks of American Idol, right? Like that kid got no truth, okay? Because you cannot sing. Uh, <laughs> we need to raise them up in grace. You matter. But we need to put them in this framework of truth that, that, that you have to grow and, and that you should be healthy and that your life should be fruitful. And there's consequences when you make bad decisions, and, and we have to talk about that. In fact, Proverbs chapter 22 talks about how we train up our children. It says if you train them up in the way that they will go, they will not depart from it. And so my question is, you know, are we training up our kids? Are we guiding them? Are we putting into place a framework that we want them to follow? Because that involves intentionality. This is the kind of person I want you to be. And, and maybe those attributes can be found right here. The kind of person that is loyal, the kind of person who's respectable, the kind of person who's responsible, the kind of person who sees the other people around them and, and wants to meet other people's needs and not just being selfish but being selfless and this framework that we want to put into place. And how are you doing at training your child in that framework? And, and here's the deal. I mean, the, the temptation is to is to just get exhausted. The temptation is to, just to get frustrated because it's not easy to keep a child in a framework. I get that. But it's going to be better for the health of the child. In fact, you know, in Ephesians, Paul puts this down in, in, in chapter 6. I love it. It says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And I love that word, exasperate. Because we all know the frustration of no expectations. Many of you, you've worked jobs where you, you literally, you said this word, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do, I'll do it. Maybe you've been on a sports team and you had a coach that like, do this and don't do that and do this and, and he keeps going back and forth like, you just, just tell me what to do. I want to do the right thing, just tell me what to do. And you, you've had that feeling of just being exasperated, just ugh. And I wonder if we don't have a whole generation just tell me what to do. Tell me who, are you, tell me who you are. Are you my parent or my friend? Because you keep going back and forth and I don't know what's what. Are you joking or are you serious? I don't know what's what. Are you, are, am I really going to have consequences or are you just going to let that slide? I don't know what, to, just tell me what to do because it's amazing. Children actually want guidance. 
They want discipline. They want to know that their life has meaning and purpose. And this is why this is so important, because their life absolutely does have meaning. And so, you know, at 242, you know, we would never, like, you know, you know say parenting is it's about grace and truth, and so now go do that. Good luck. You know, like, we didn't, we won't want to send you out like that. Um, maybe for some of you, you're in that midst of parenting. Um, we have a small group that's starting. Um, it's called Spiritual Parenting. In fact, if you go out in the tailgate, I believe there's going to be a man in a hot dog uniform. <laughs> that's Morgan, okay? And, uh, and Morgan and Kira are going to be leading this group, Spiritual Parenting. And as we get bigger and bigger as a church, our heart is to get smaller. And I would never want you to feel like you're struggling in this area of parenting and leave this room and feel like, well, it's just hopeless because nobody cares. We absolutely care. We encourage you to go talk to Morgan, to go talk to Kira, get in this group, and join some other parents who are on the same journey with you. And like I said at the beginning of the service, the reason why this is so important is because the children matter to God. You see, the greatest lie that we tell our kids is that you're going to do something great one day. The greatest lie we tell our kids is that you will grow up one day. You will be responsible one day. God will use you one day. I, don't, I, I just don't see that in Scripture. Do you know what I see in Scripture? I see Samuel, who was 13 when God called him to speak for him. I see David, who was a boy when he killed a giant. I see Mary, who was a young girl when she said, may it be as you say, Lord, and gave birth to Jesus. I see these disciples, these disciples who were most likely all in their upper teenage years. Think about that. I see Paul, when he was leaving the church of Ephesus and he had to raise up a leader to take over a church of an entire city, he put Timothy in charge a 16-year-old young man. And Paul told Timothy, he said, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. You set an example in speech, life, love, and faith, and impurity. You lead this church. And Paul let him loose. Are our children ready to answer that kind of call? If God called your child at 13, 16, 18, would they be ready to step into that journey, step into that mission? Are we raising up a generation that's ready to go out and do their part in the kingdom of God? That is the challenge. That's why this is important. And that's what, why we want to come alongside you as best we can. 